Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Cover One Roundup here live each and every Monday night on the Cover One YouTube channel at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time or subsequently wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, Kyle Slage. Join this and every week by David Fox, at least the weeks when I am here. Uh, and the Buffalo Bills preseason is finally over. The next time they take to the field, it will to be to take on, it will be to take on the Los Angeles Rams in week one of their Super Bowl winning season in week one of the 2022 NFL season that is a week from this upcoming Thursday but we have a lot of things that have to happen uh before that before that game happens uh sorry I read a, read a comment already it's time for Kyle the sassy Salagi. that's right man that's right. I, I'm loving the brand. I should. I, I should think, up the sassy. I think we found brand. a new uh, a new Twitter name for you. The sassy. The sassy. I, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I, I could live up to that brand. I could make that work. Uh, mm-hmm. and so again, yes. Uh, preseason is over. <laughs> Unceremonious end to the preseason to the ten game preseason win streak. Of course, mm-hmm. last weekend losing to the Carolina <clears throat> Panthers by the score of twenty one to nothing. Uh, I think their minds were elsewhere during that game. I think that's a could fair they, assessment. Could, could they be? Maybe, maybe there was something else going on that kind of prevented them from playing all that well, uh, prevented Sean McDermott from coaching all that well. But we'll get into that maybe a little bit, not too much. But uh, so we'll certainly touch on that. Uh, and then also the Bills uh, and the rest of the NFL, they have to get down to 53 players by 4 p.m. tomorrow. So on this episode of The Roundup, David and I are going to give our just final all-encompassing preseason thoughts and then our final roster predictions. So I think that pretty much uh, sums up what we're doing today. David, what's going on? Man, I am so excited to be done with preseason. We're always excited when preseason starts, and then we're like, Oh wait, this is just really right, boring a lot of the time. You know, it's, this stinks. Yeah, it's like uh, unless you're like, unless you're just really enjoying the backups playing well and getting a lot of points or whatever. But like, even then, it's kind of boring. And then you have a game like what the Bills played against Carolina, where it's just like, oh my god. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> You're just like, is there nothing better I can do with my life than watch a bunch of future accountants play football? <laughs> oh, there certainly are. There are certainly better things you could be doing, but this is the one we signed up for. This is the one we chose. We have to be doing this. It's not fun, uh, but it is. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I love I'm just watching. I'm glad that I didn't watch it live at the time because I knew I wasn't going to be able to you know, finish the game and actually write something worthwhile. So I just woke up early on Saturday. I was like, all right, well, something to do on Saturday while I have my corn muffin or whatever. And yeah, that was it. Corn but, muffin? Are you on uh, you, you on TikTok? Are you, are you all over that uh, new corn trend? No. Um, also, corn is not a new thing. Don't know if you know that, Kyle. Um, I know. <laughs> I know the concept of corn is quite dated, right? Corn itself has been around for quite some time. But no, there's uh, all, all over TikTok. It's the sound. It's the new sound. There's a kid, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago, devoted his love for corn, uh, just was very descriptive about his love for corn. Now there's a song about it. It's it's peak 2008 internet in the year 2022. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> I think that wraps up corn talk. Un- unless we're talking about Brett Kern, future Bill's punter. That could... Uh... Fucking Gen Z, I swear. Ooh. It's awesome. Just call it out. Just call it out. I don't care. This is the best generation because we we're doing the things that the the previous generation did, and we're just (laughs) we still make fun of them for doing it. We're just doing the same things. Corn isn't real. I agree. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Before we get into actual Bills talk, this show and Cover One in general, David, this is a great time to do do the ad read. This show and Cover One in general are brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. David, tell us a little bit about Underdog. Folks, let me tell you something about Underdog. Uh, We here at Cover One are very excited to be partnering with the most dynamic name in fantasy football, and that is Underdog Fantasy. If you have your one home league and that one draft each year isn't enough for you, what are you doing with your life? Watching preseason football? Crazies. You need underdog fantasy. 
all the fun of drafting your own players, but without the waivers and lineup decisions. Best ball drafts allow you to have all the fun of drafting your team, all the chances to win big with none of the week-to-week hassle. If you use the promo code COVER1, that's the number one, when signing up to make your first deposit, then Underdog will match that deposit up to $100. That's 100 free U.S., presumably, dollars in free play if you use promo code COVER1. Even better, Underdog's Best Ball Mania 3 contest is going to make three players millionaires. That's right, $10 million in total prizes, $2 million to the first, a $1 million to the second, and a $1 million bonus to the team with the most regular season points. That is three chances to win a $1 million. Sign up now using promo code COVER1 and take your chance at a $1 million today with Underdog Fantasy. Again, that is promo code COVER1. Also a little bit more housekeeping. Make sure to subscribe to the Cover One YouTube channel while you're here. Please and thank you. A lot of great stuff going on here. This show is certainly something that this channel does. Uh, Then there's the Air Raid Hour on Mondays. And then we got tomorrow. We got Film Room. We got Going Deep on Wednesdays. We have Disguised Coverage. And we have Cover One Buffalo. Great stuff. Also, if you like all of this content, make sure to check out Cover One One Pass. Become an insider. Check this out. All the great stuff's on the screen. Uh, Exclusive content, exclusive in-depth written stuff. You get access to the Cover One Premium Slack. It's only 57 US dollars per month. That I can confirm that the the actual currency is US Mm. dollars. So, Cover One, One Pass. Become an insider. Thank you all. Okay. Let's get into it, David. The Roundup Roundup. Mm. This is the segment where we talk about the latest Buffalo Bills news, rumors, and all that other good stuff in a short roundup fashion. So the Bills cut Matt Ariza uh, uh, last week, or, or a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. In hindsight, David, maybe we shouldn't have deified the punter. We are now punt uh, atheists on this yeah. podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> not only do we no longer believe in punt God, we don't believe in the concept of punting in general In general, now. yeah. So... Just, just be prepared every uh, every roundup moving forward after after each game to just have us complain about any time the Bills punt this season. Just, just be fully ready and prepared for that. Um, there's really not a lot that needs to be said here, right? Mm-hmm. A lot has been said in the last couple of days about this particular situation. Um, if if anyone is interested, I uh, I saw a a really interesting. Um, I thought pretty pretty well spoken interview with Mitch Morse in the locker room today. Um, probably about a minute and a half. I think I just retweeted it. Uh, so if you want to check that out, um, definitely worth uh, looking at. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah. I mean, there, there's really yeah. actually actually here. Let, let's let's do this, Ned Ryerson. Let's leave to Araya's discussion just at that. He's gone. Cut. Let's move on. Exactly. I agree. <laughs> right. They, they made the necessary and correct decision. That's all I yep. have to say about That's the all. Matariza yep. situation. Uh, and in that uh, Mitch Morse video that you retweeted, there is a reporter who looks identical to Mike McDaniel in the background. I was going to. So, I was thinking that. I was thinking that. <laughs> so someone needs. To, that could be Mike McDaniel. He's the new <laughs> Belichick, right? But he's doing. He's spying. <laughs> In a much more creative way because he very much could pass for an NFL beat I, reporter. I, I thought Mike McDaniel or maybe Nate Geary. <laughs> Ooh, was that Nate Geary? I'm, I'm not. I'm... No, that's not. No, that's not Nate Geary. I, I, uh, I figured I knew it wasn't, but I was like, uh, uh, is it though? It could be. It could pass. <clears throat> could pass. Uh, but no, that's that's a that, that guy's a dead ringer for Mike McDaniel. That guy's <laughs> uh, you know trying to. I don't. Again, I feel that bad. dude There's, is quoting too many rappers in his in his in his social conversation. Probably a perfectly fine guy, perfectly nice dude, and we're yeah. just like, it looks like Mike McDaniel. Looks like a football coach. You know, neither of us are particularly sold on thus far. <laughs> um, okay, and also we will get into uh, or Steve Noble writes. Let's let's briefly talk about the punter situation because mm. uh, look, the Bills are now without a punter. And it just so happens that a number of good punters have been cut around the league or are going to be cut tomorrow. One of them being Grand Island native and former uh, NFL All-Pro Brett Kern. Uh, Steve Noble writes, Kern getting cut may be a blessing for Bills fans in the long run. A great story for Buffalo. Talk about a great story. I mean, like, look, a couple of years ago when the Bills were really sad and bad, 
I remember just like being like, oh, Brett Kern, that would be a fun story for him to come. Like back when we used to have to care mm. about the punter, like it's right. stories like that. Uh, and that's when I was working for the website. So it was just like the idea of a punter from Buffalo. You know, you, you right. love the hometown guy. Uh, yeah. Now it really wouldn't matter, but it still is a good story. He's still good. A couple of other good punters. So David, uh, and Michael Pilardi, I know, tried out. Just what are your, I just had a mini stroke. What are your just thoughts on the, on the punter position here? Uh, do you have any favorites or do you, or do you not really care? I really don't care, but. Um, it would be nice to get a recognizable name. Someone like a Brett Kern who has been a, I mean, long time. He was with the Titans since 2009. I mean, absolutely ridiculously long career with uh, the Titans. And uh, listen, for for as much as I have made fun of and belittled the immaculate Jeff Fisher throughout his football coaching career, uh, and deservedly so, uh, if there's one thing that that man like really uh, focuses and, and t- tends to get right is special teams. And he, he is a, someone who brought in Brett Kern. And uh, I mean, every coaching staff after – uh, Jeff Fisher in Tennessee has seen reason to keep him, and for good reason. He's been an all pro before. He's been a phenomenal punter, best punter easily in that franchise's history. Um, I, I, I guess that would be my number one if you if we want to do that. But I mean, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh no, they didn't get Brett Kern. Yeah. Like, yeah, so be it. I mean, um, there, are, there are people who are genuinely saying they should just keep Matt Barkley to punt, which. Um, it's, it's something that could happen, realistically. <laughs> it's definitely listen, something that could listen, happen. Listen, good for Matt Barkley for coming in there and actually firing off like one good punt and like a, you know, kind of a weird shank for his first punt. Um, but like, we're, you're not rolling into week one of the regular season where you are the opening ticket. And rolling out Matt Barkley as your punter. <laughs> That's not a thing that they want to do because that would be stupid. Like, I'm sorry. If you think that, if you need, you're a little cracked in the head and you need to just start looking up who the next punter, the actual punter is going to be. Ned Ryerson writes, <clears throat> Kern made $3.2 million last year. He's likely going to have to take a pay cut. I think he knows that. I think he's yeah. currently in the mindset of I'm not getting a significant deal wherever I go, given that I was cut the day before roster cut downs and teams are just now putting the finishing touches on their roster. And there, a lot of them are up against the cap and have to make, you know, financial decisions and teams really don't have $3 million to be giving to a punter at this time of year. So uh, I think he is expecting wherever he goes to take a bit of a discount, probably less than he should be worth. Uh, he probably knows he's going to get a one year deal wherever he goes. So uh Imagine being sides. able to make over three million dollars in a single year by punting the football. Wish I could do it. Crazy, crazy. Wish I could do it. And I'm mm. I'm going to talk about it later, right? One of the truer rubbish segments is about me potentially mm. joining the NFL. So that's my announcement for this week. Right. I am pursuing a career in the NFL. We'll talk about it later. Okay. Got there speed, is some. Goodman. There is something uh, I also have to bring up uh, because I would be it, it would be irresponsible of me to not bring this up. LaVisca Chenault got traded today, David. Uh, he's my favorite player in the NFL, uh, hands down. I, I have a couple of favorites. Lafayette Pitts is one of them. Daryl Johnson mm-hmm. is another. But LaVisca Chenault, kind of above all, that's <clears> my guy. Uh, if there's one that's going to make it, it's going to be LaVisca Chenault. But not anymore because he got traded to the – God forsaken <laughs> Carolina Panthers with Matt Rule. And like I'm I'm sitting here like, you know, last year it was like, oh, what can Urban Meyer do with LaVisca at all? <laughs> now it's like, what or, or then I was thinking, like, okay, what's <clears throat> Doug Peterson gonna do? Give mm-hmm. Zay Jones reps instead of LaVisca Chenault? No shot. Um, but uh, alas, turns gets, out <laughs> gets traded. LaVisca Chenault gets traded to Carolina where he's working with Matt Rule and Ben McAdoo. The NFL is against LaVisca Chenault. There is a concerted effort to make sure he fails. And I'm launching a full investigation. It's a conspiracy. Um, There's got to be some play on QAnon. Someone figure it out (laughs) in chat. Someone get a play on QAnon involving LaVisca Chenault. LaVisca, something like that. There's got to be something that that makes sense. 
uh, and I am the head of it because th there's a concerted <clears throat> effort to make him fail. Though I will say, this is quite toxic of me, Baker Mayfield did not look bad against the Bills. Um, yeah. Listen, listen. Baker Mayfield is going to be the starter for the Panthers in week one. We know that. Mm -hmm. And they're playing Cleveland in week one. Like, I, I'm telling you, that's the game I'm tuning into. Yeah. And, like, thank God the Bills are not playing at 1 o'clock on that Sunday because I am going to be glued to the TV watching Baker Mayfield go against the Cleveland Browns with the Carolina Panthers because that's going to just be, oh, oh, my gosh. If he doesn't throw for 500 yards and, like, 80 touchdowns, I'm going to be a little disappointed. And they have fun weapons. They have DJ sort Moore, of, yeah. Robbie Anderson. I like Robbie Anderson, what? Christian McCaffrey, the ghost of Christian McCaffrey, or sure. maybe actual <clears throat> Christian McCaffrey. Who, who's and now LaVisca? Yeah. First That's play of the game. What is – what should we set the over-under for the first play of the game being – is this over-under? I don't know gambling enough. Me neither. Um, <laughs> but let's just say, what are the odds of the first play of the game or the first, like, offensive play for the Panthers being, like, an end-around to LaVisca Chanel or, like, a jet sweep to LaVisca Chanel? Uh, I, I – I, what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mark writes, why are we talking about LaVisca? Is he going to the Bills? No. So why do we care? See, as I said, LaVisca Chenault is my favorite player in the NFL. And I'm going to use my platform that I've been so graciously given by Cover One to talk so about LaVisca Chenault. And uh, yeah, I don't know why, but they've given me this platform and I'm going to spread my LaVisca Chenault. Um, uh, LaVisca Chenault, yeah. <laughs> LaVisca Chenault? Uh, Chine oh no! <laughs> I just got it. I'm gonna spread means, my Lavisca Chenault's narratives. Okay, that means it's time to move on. <laughs> I'm gonna spread my narratives whenever given the opportunity. So the Buffalo Bills lost to the Carolina Panthers. Lavisca Chenault's new team. There was the transition. There we there go. We now I'm now I'm out of it. I'm so defeated because uh, the people don't like Lavisca Chenault. Upsetting, but. Okay, so the Buffalo Bills lost. Uh, they finished the preseason two and one, which, all things considered, I mean, look, they were uh, the Bills' backups and third stringers were playing against the Panthers' starters for much of that game, and then combine yeah. that with the fact that there was again a cloud hanging over the team. Uh, whatever, we can kind of write that game off. There were maybe a few things that we learned about special, or some special teams things, maybe, uh, maybe a few depth guys got an opportunity to shine. Tommy Sweeney played well, but. Uh, largely you can write that game off, but the preseason as a whole, uh, I think generally promising, right? The times that we did see the starters, namely against Denver, they looked pretty good, right? Josh Allen's yeah. good. James Cook looked good against Denver. We'll talk about James Cook here momentarily. Um, but just David, before we get into the more nitty gritty about the, our specific, just overarching thoughts about the preseason or takeaways from the preseason, what, were, what are your just general thoughts and opinions? Um, this is a very deep team. Mm -hmm. And also I'm bored. I am yes. bored of the preseason. I don't want to watch any more of this. I'm glad I don't have to. Um, I'm glad that the NFL got rid of the fourth week of the preseason because that was always the worst week of the preseason. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm glad I don't have to talk about the 2022 NFL preseason anymore because it's dumb and boring and over. So as I was putting this show together today, I'm not going to lie. I was very scared. I was just fearful for my life throughout this show preparation because mm. uh, again, you just never know when you're this close to roster cut down day and given Brandon being a bit of a wild card as a human being, uh, you just never know when he's going to make his final cuts, when he's going to announce his final cut. So I was like, Look, I could be prepping all of these points that I want to talk about, that I want to bring up on the show, and they could all be eliminated because he trades one of the dudes I want to talk mm. about. Or maybe he just cuts all of his players now, and he figures it all out now. And yes, sir. Right. Thankfully, nothing happened, and we're on air now. Or a few things did happen. The Bills did make a few cuts. No one, you know, of crazy relevance. The biggest name was right. Josh Thomas, who was of... Uh, some relevance last year, people were kind of saying uh, that there was the Josh Thomas hive last year. I did see some uh, sentiment that he was actually better than DeMar Hamlin, which wrong, but 
Uh, yeah. I mean, Josh <laughs> Thomas will probably be back on the practice squad along with maybe a few of the guys cut today, but otherwise nothing crazy uh, out of the six or whatever cuts there were today. But just looking, uh, so I was just, I was scared, right? That he was going to make a few moves, didn't. Uh, so largely we can just talk about what we had prepped. Uh, that, that's just a note for David and I. But um, with Zach Moss, there were some uh, some Zach Moss rumors today. That was one of the things that I was scared about. Uh, there was some sentiment that maybe Zach Moss could get moved today for a day three pick. Uh, Aaron Wilson has uh, thus far or has since reported that 0% chance he gets moved. Yeah. Zach Moss will be a Buffalo Bill next year. So uh, I think that's expected, right? I think we all expected Zach Moss to, to be at least part of the committee. Uh, we'll see how big of a role he has in said committee as it, it moves forward here. But I preface this by saying I was scared about prepping for the show and just things happening because my point, my, my first takeaway or just thing that we learned about the preseason is that the Bills have an admirable, if not strange, situation at running back because they have five guys who realistically could be playing in the NFL. Six if you want to count Taiwan Jones. Uh, I don't know why you would count Taiwan Jones, seeing as he's not really a, a running back. I don't remember the last offensive snap he's taken with the Buffalo Bills, but he's listed as, as a running back. But just for the sake of this argument or this discussion, we will say that the Bills have five actual running backs who I am comfortable with having on this roster. Number one, of course, is Devin Singletary. We know what he is. He's going to be the lead guy in the committee. Uh, again, the key phrase there, committee, right? It's going to be divvied up, but I think Singletary is going to get the bulk of the carry. Zach Moss, we know now, uh, you know, regardless of what your opinions are on Zach Moss as a player, you know, if you don't think he's lived up to the hype, if you don't like him as a player, or if you think he's running back one, whatever, I think we can all agree that he is an NFL caliber player. He is a very rosterable player, and the Bills appear to think so as well, as it looks like he's a roster lock. And James Cook, they just spent a second round pick on him and, uh, you know, a, a rather electric player, I would say, has flashed this preseason at times, is going to be a big part of the passing game out of the backfield. And then you look at the depth. You got Duke Johnson, who has really flashed this preseason, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And you have Raheem Blackshear, who has been maybe the star of the preseason so far. And by so far, I mean in general, because it's over, thankfully. Uh, Raheem Blackshear, <laughs> the undrafted running back out of Virginia Tech, I believe 116 yards on 24 carries with two touchdowns. That's good for 4.9 yards per carry. Okay, and like you can say, yes, he was doing it against backups and third stringers, right. but like he wasn't playing with the first team offensive line, certainly. So like yeah. the, the success, it's relative, but it's not as relative as some people may paint it to be. Uh, because look, and we always say, right, that that lower tier defensive talent is a hell of a lot more talented than the lower tier offensive line talent. So theoretically, you'd think that would have uh, prevented Raheem Blackshear from performing to his uh, best abilities. But again, he still averages 4.9 yards per carry, also has 93 yards on eight receptions. Uh, Raheem Blackshear just showed good vision, cutting ability. I think that was kind of the just the, the cut on a dime ability from Raheem Blackshear we saw. Uh, just very interesting, right? He He's not going to be on the Bills roster, I don't think. I, I can't find a way to get Raheem Blackshear on the Bills roster, despite what my friend told me, my friend suggested. And he also said that uh, he heard this on WGR. So I want to know mm. who brought this up on WGR. Who? I pray it was a caller. I pray it was a caller. But my friend told me that they were discussing on WGR the possibility of cutting uh, both Case Keenum and Matt Barkley, keeping both of them on the practice squad, and then using one of those roster spots on Raheem Blackshear. Which is a an interesting thought. It's an interesting... It's certainly an interesting thought. It's a galaxy brain move. It's one that I can't comprehend, and thus I'm not really going to talk about it all that much. I just think it's interesting, right? It's an interesting thought. Uh, But regardless, Raheem Blackshear really shined this preseason. And then you also have Duke Johnson, who a different player, but again, flashed at times. 84 yards on 21 attempts also showed similar cutting ability, right? Uh, Just a very well-rounded 
and strange backfield, again, that I would like yeah. to just kind of wrap up here with the Bills because they have five guys, none of whom are world beaters by any mean. None of them are like particularly elite in any specific thing, but they're all just like, you know, all relatively, uh, there are some that are more well-rounded than others, but all of them relatively well-rounded players. All of them have their specific and certain individual strengths. Uh, but just you look at what they have, right? Because they have, again, five players who I think realistically all five could be with the Bills in some capacity. I think Raheem Blackshear is going to be a practice squad guy. I don't know if Duke Johnson sticks on a 53-man roster elsewhere. I think he could, but I think he could also be back on the practice squad with the Bills. So then you have five guys who the Bills could choose from to be part of this running back committee at any or at any time in any given week, right? Just based on matchup. Maybe they like a, a Singletary-Moss combination one week and then a Singletary-Cook combination the next week or a Moss-Cook or a Moss-Blackshear, right? There's a lot of different things they can do. But it also needs to be asked, how many running backs are they going to keep active every week, realistically? This is a team <clears throat> that for the last couple of years has been – very wide receiver heavy. It was a team last year that only activated a single tight end down the stretch of the season and really leaned heavily on one running back. Obviously, some of that's going to change. We've talked about their shift more towards 12 personnel. We've talked about just now with how many running backs they have and what who they're planning on using because they are we're, we're, we're basically guaranteeing three running backs making this roster with seven with uh, Singletary and Cook and Moss. Add in Reggie Gilliam to this, of course, because technically he's a running back as a fullback. I mean, what, what, what do we need here? I mean, like, it's nice to have a Duke Johnson. It's nice to have a Raheem Blackshear. What are they bringing to the table that the other three are not? Other than maybe the ability to return kicks, right? Blackshear as a as a teamer. Um, uh, Duke Johnson's Duke been able Johnson, to return. Duke kicks. Johnson does that too. I just think like it's a unique way to attack the running back position. I think in general, right? The idea of because uh, they they have five guys. They're realistically only going to focus on three, right? Singletary, Moss, and Cook. But like. I don't know if they're activating all of them every week. Yeah. I, I I don't think you're going to see four active running backs, including Taiwan Jones, each game day. I don't think you're getting Singletary, Moss, Cook every week. I don't think you're getting that. So it's just going to be, again, it's a strange situation that they've gotten themselves in. Just to not go with the do-it-all bell cow back and instead try to uh, formulate one running back with two or three guys. It's just... Yeah. It's a unique, maybe not unique, but it's interesting. And I guess that's really my biggest takeaway here, uh, or one of my biggest takeaways about the running back position is just it is. Uh, I'm not really, I'm not sold on it yet, right? Uh, yeah. Granted, we haven't seen Singletary. We haven't really seen Moss that much. We've seen Cook. I, I'm just going to have to wait until the regular season to see what happens here, what goes down. Yeah, I mean, uh I'll be honest, outside of um, the the top three, I just don't really see myself being overly interested. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in seeing who they do keep, but, like, I'm not going to be upset if they don't keep Blackshear. I'm not going to be upset if they don't keep uh, Duke Johnson. I just – there's so many other aspects to this team, both on offense and defense, that is kind of just like, you know, so be it. You know, we're, 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 we're arguing over which good player they keep, or at least which halfway decent player is worth keeping. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and, and, and as a fourth or fifth running back, essentially. And again, that's, that's you know, Taiwan Jones is, is certainly a factor here as a running back, at least, you know, by definition, but right, reality yeah. is he's a special teamer. So that doesn't really matter so much, but, you know, it's whatever they pick who they pick and whoever they don't is probably gonna end up on a on another team and playing probably decently well i agree 
Uh, and then I just have like a second all encompassing thought here because I do want to get to roster talk relatively quickly. Um, just my, my thought, you, you brought it up earlier, David, this is the deepest team I've ever seen, right? Just like they have fun backups to watch. Stupid. It's stupid. Uh, they, they don't even need a second or third quarterback, right? Because you got, <laughs> you, you can keep Raheem Blackshear, but, uh, no, like quarterbacks aside, right. We were just talking about fun fourth and fifth running backs who you could have a legitimate discussion about uh, them factoring into the game day roster. Of course, from the practice squad, they're not making the active roster, but you you can talk about them potentially getting roles, whether it be on special teams or maybe getting onto the actual field. Uh, We'll talk about Isaiah Hodgins later, right? Like there is a legitimate debate about sixth and seventh wide receivers, right? Because they, they have like seven rosterable receivers. Uh, you look at the defensive line, they have like what 12 defensive linemen who are mm-hmm. actually like formidable and fun to watch the, the cornerback discussion. One of my takes later about cornerbacks is I could see them rostering eight corners. They have eight corners that I think deserve a spot on this roster and that you just can't carry eight corners, 12 defensive backs. I cannot see them doing that, but also yeah. I wouldn't be shocked because they have eight NFL cornerbacks. It's just an incredibly deep roster, really at every position, maybe not linebacker, right? I I talked a couple weeks ago, the last time I was on, about the linebacker position and how maybe the depth was a little bit better uh, than I thought. The preseason kind of uh, went on and maybe it wasn't as good as initially expected, right? Bernard and Spector. Uh, looked fine as the preseason progressed, but also were exposed a little bit there, which is to be expected out of a day two and day three rookie, respectively. But uh, so like the linebacker depth isn't insane by any means, but it's not bad. You got Andre Smith, who looks okay. You got Tyrell Dodson, who's fine. Like they have depth all over this roster. And like it, we don't even really, this is the last time we're going to be talking about it because the actual top of the roster is so stacked. Yeah. It's just, it's a masterclass. It's a Brandon Bean masterclass. I mean, this it's it's kind of crazy just how deep this roster is while still being, like, so talented at the top. I mean, it, it, you usually sacrifice one for the other, right? Where you're just like, you've got a bunch, like, like the Rams, right? Like, they, they mm-hmm. completely sacrifice depth to just say, like, we're, we're going to be a Stars and Scrubs team. Where we're good, we're going to be, like, elite, elite. We have Aaron Donald, we have Jalen Ramsey, we've got Matt Stafford, and we've got uh, Cooper Cup. Like, uh, that's insane talent just with those four players. But so much of the rest of that roster is like, oh, man. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is a rough time. But they've also been fortunate in being able to develop a lot of those players into being good enough where they're not just being, like, cooked and taken advantage of every single game. Um, but with the Bills, they I mean they've just said, look, we're going to go and 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 build this team the best way that we can. And the depth on defense in particular is just insane. The depth at running back and wide receiver is crazy. Uh, having a a top three to five quarterback is amazing. Uh, it's just I, I don't I don't know what else to to say to this other than I don't know maybe be a little bit better with the offensive line but but then you went out and you got one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL who we're going to talk about in a second here right here momentarily um it's just, it's just amazing it's amazing what Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott have done and especially now that they played Carolina and the way that Carolina is right now. I just sometimes wonder what Panthers fans must be thinking, looking at Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott in Buffalo so and thinking like, they were right here. We kept Ron Rivera and Marty Herney and and let these two go. Uh, it's just, that, that, that's got to sting a little bit. It's, you, it, I, you, you can't, but you, but you can't think about that, right? If you're a fan, you can't just be like, you can't do that. Otherwise, it's how we're gonna feel. It's how we're gonna feel in five years with Dable and Joe Shane. You just wait, <laughs> right? You just wait. 
Uh, no, obviously that's a joke. But just like, yeah, their eye for talent is insane. And like they just get these, they pluck these guys out of obscurity, these UDFAs, throw them on the practice yeah. squad for two years. And then you talk about them in a random preseason. It's like, oh, he's a good player. Or it's just like, oh, Cam Lewis, yeah. the, the UDFA out of Buffalo, very good player. <laughs> or just yeah. like Nick McLeod, very good player. Just like wild. It, that's really all I have to say. So, David, Aaron Cromer. What's your, Aaron what's Cromer, your general takeaway here about Aaron? Aaron Cromer is amazing. And um, if we're going to replace one deity with another, let's let it be Aaron Cromer. Mm-hmm. Uh, because he is – look, we how many times have we – taking a dump on Bobby Hart on just on this podcast, much less on social media and other places in our lives. You know, I've, I've several times I made a tweet one time. Sorry to cut you off here, but no, no, uh, fine. I made a bad cup of coffee. It tasted kind of like gasoline. Don't ask me sure. how it happened, but it, okay. it did. Okay. It wasn't good. So I'm, I just sent a tweet. I was like, I forgot how to make coffee. Streets are saying I don't have it anymore. They're calling me the Bobby Hart of making coffee. Where, you know, it's just like stupid yeah. stuff where Bobby Hart is a synonym for being bad at something. Yeah. Continue. And now Bobby Hart is like average. Right. Average. <laughs> cup of, right. A, a Tim Hortons cup of coffee. That's sure. the Bobby Hart of coffee. Now. Sure. We're like, you know, and, and, and part of it, part of it is because part of it is a position change, right? They moved him from trying to be this backup left tackle to being a, a, a swing guard, essentially. And he's just been like, all right, like he's 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 fine now. Like he's mm-hmm. not a turnstile. He's not like dominating and destroying, you know, a bunch of different uh, major players. But like uh, Eric Eric pointed this out on Twitter earlier this week after that Panthers game, where I mean he's holding his own against Derek Brown, who is a pretty pretty tough guy to go against. Yeah, like that's not that's not nothing. It's it's really impressive um, how far he's come, and 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 I think that we're all going to see a really, really impressive um, improvement for this offensive line in in twenty twenty two. It's going to be really cool to watch this team and how they transition to all of this, uh, you know, more zone scheme. And just seeing, you know, guys like Deion Dawkins and Mitch Morse really take to this. And even Spencer Brown, who, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get to him a little bit later as well. But it's it's super impressive. And Aaron Cromer deserves so much credit, even just in the uh, in the preseason. You clearly see his imprint and and his 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 teaching out there on the field, even as even as early as the preseason. So I'm very excited for that. I'm excited for Spencer Brown to get back, right? Because yeah. his thing was like incredible athlete just needs to put it all together. And I, I'm not saying Bobby Johnson isn't a good coach. I'm just saying Aaron Cromer is a better coach. So I would. Well, I, Aaron Cromer brings his fights to children on the beach over beach chairs. Whereas Bobby Johnson brings the fight to practices mm-hmm. with That's defending with, with linebackers. So That's a good point. It, the the real lesson here, the real takeaway is like don't don't mess with your old line coach, like that should and, be a and, given though. Right? Listen, listen, I you, you learned that I learned that playing offensive line in high school. I mean, there was there was oh my gosh, I, I don't well, how much we got time for this. Um, <laughs> um, so my uh, my offensive line coach in high school was actually actually used to uh, he played uh, linebacker at the University of Florida. Uh, was a uh, uh, was on the teams, I think, when Emmett Smith was there, if I am remembering that. Um, and he he said, I can neither confirm or deny this. I was not there. This was in like the 80s or whatever. But he said he may have bitten off someone's calf at some point. You know, Dan just... Campbell. <laughs> Um, and before before a game, before a game against one of our our rivals who absolutely wrecked us as expected, um, he he just took me aside and he's like, "Listen, listen, listen, I'm, I sh- I'm, I'm telling you right now, you sh- you gotta open up a can of whoop ass on this team. You just gotta open up a can of whoop ass on this team. Let's go, let's go." Coach is Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> <laughs> open up a can of whoop ass. What? 
I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty fired up after that. <laughs> oh, hell yeah, dude. Anyone would be. Any person with a beating heart would be fired up after that. <sighs> what's the uh, what's the second takeaway here from the second preseason? Takeaway. We got to get into roster talk because we're forty minutes. Second deep. takeaway. This is this will this will be easy. Actually, this will be quick. Uh, the number one. This is the number one defense in 2021 by GVOA and by quite a few uh, metrics. Um, and the fact is, they're probably going to be better this year, which is insane. I mean, adding adding Von Miller is an obvious thing because he's even if he's not like the Von Miller of 2015, where he's you know dominating the Patriots in the AFC Championship and getting the Super Bowl MVP the you know two weeks later, he still got a lot of the tank. He still got a lot of juice. Like this dude is still a. a phenomenal player a great pass rusher he's just gonna be so good i think he's going to open up so many opportunities for guys like ed oliver and greg Rousseau. I, i'm so so excited to see von miller on this team i am so excited to see guys like tim settle and jordan phillips and shaq austin being the rotational guys mm-hmm. right like that that's crazy that's absolutely crazy and 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 you know for uh, we'll we'll talk about corner later as we've teased already, but having like somebody like Dane Jackson who we know has been solid, um, Kair Elam who has plenty of tools available to him, and that's before Trey White comes back, and then having Tara Johnson who's a top three nickel corner. I mean, this is an insane defense, and then you have a, a, a first team All Pro in Jordan Poyer and a second team All Pro in Micah Hyde. Crazy. It's just crazy. This whole defense and the depth that they have is just crazy. And it's being led by a, an incredibly smart and, and and intelligent coaching staff with, with McDermott and Frazier and, and guys like Bobby Babbage and John Butler. It's, just, it's crazy. This is an insane, insanely talented and well-coached defense. And that, that what, you literally cannot ask for any more than that. And they're going to be on a tear. After yeah. after how that season ended, right? Because look, they I'm sure they would be the first people to tell you they didn't play the greatest game of their lives in Kansas City, uh, especially not in that final uh, stretch yeah. of the fourth quarter and in overtime. So uh, I'm sure they're coming back on a little bit of a revenge tour here. So I do have one question, uh, and this will serve as a transition, and I would like to raise it to chat as well. What did we learn about the return game in the preseason do we know who's returning kicks yet or punts no <laughs> I, I don't know no uh, I, it, we, we we came in with a set of names we still mm-hmm. have the set of names and we really haven't and no one really took the ball and ran with it literally or you know perverted it, 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 okay it kind of seems like Khalil Shakir's got to be returning punts right it does like he seemed to be from like the first game all throughout the rest of the preseason, like they seem to be pretty comfortable with him returning punts and he seems consistent catching the ball and getting like, I don't know, five yards, whatever. As long as he's not fumbling and I'm not holding my breath every single time Isaiah McKenzie or Marquez Stevenson. By the way, what's going on with Marquez Stevenson? Does he exist? So far, yeah. (laughs) He got hurt. Uh, of course I, he's, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. What else is new? Um, but no, uh, I think, yeah, the plan is they're going to, uh, try, they're going to carry him on the roster. So I think you'll see tomorrow he'll make the initial 53 probably. And then he'll, mm. um, he'll get put on IR. You might see like a, see, I don't even know. I know Greg has tweeted about this a couple of times, the wait in the parking lot dudes. Uh, there, there's probably going to be a couple of yeah. those tomorrow as they, you know, figure out who they're going to put on IR and things of that sort. But it's probably going to be Shakir, I would agree. But returning kicks, I just don't know. Uh, I am glad that Shakir, we've talked about this since they drafted yeah. Shakir, uh, the idea of him being a returner and then that getting him the game day active spot and then, you know, yeah. good things happen when he's, you know, yeah. he has a jersey on on Sunday. So <laughs> returning kicks, though, I is it going to be James Cook? James, I, I love James Cook didn't really do much for me as a kick returner. Yeah, I'm with you. There there didn't seem to be any standouts in the kick return game. It seems like they're not sure. 
maybe they're just going to go with Isaiah McKenzie at first and just sort of see what happens there. I don't know. It, it's, it seems very, uh, very iffy and, and uncertain right now. So we'll see. That's the first place I'm looking when that depth chart comes out it yeah. is who who is playing on teams? Uh, who is returning kicks and punts? Someone who uh, th- that would have been a good transition, but it would have spoiled my first roster prediction. So now we're moving into the roster predictions. What we are not going to do is go position by position and say who we think is going to make the roster at each position because that gets boring and monotonous to talk about. I can't imagine what and we only have like an to. hour before every hour. Comes that out, that so, too. You know. uh, but like I, I've done that on past shows where it's just like quarterback, these guys, running back, these guys. Mm-hmm. And by the time I get to the DL, I'm like, I'm tired. I would like to go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, but with, uh, you know, this this format that I've concocted here, what we're going to do is just go back and forth and pretty much cover the biggest questions, right? Because, look, the Bills roster, we've said, very deep, very talented. But I think the first, like, 48 roster spots are pretty set in stone. I don't think you're going to get a lot of debate, right? No one's going to be debating Barkley not making it, Keenum making it, uh, Cook, Jones. Like, no one's really... Uh, debating the bottom of a lot of these positions, uh, except for like wide receiver, cornerback, um, tight end. And these are all positions that we'll talk about. So we will hit the biggest questions. Uh, and if we don't in chat, please uh, bring it up and we will make sure to get to your questions uh, regarding the bottom of the Bills roster. So I would like to start with my first roster thought slash prediction, if you will. <sighs> This is the bold one, and the chat's mm. going to hate me for it. I, I can already tell how, the, the chat's going to be very anti-Kyle, more so than they Bring already are. Though he's done enough, in my opinion, to make the roster, and he certainly has done enough to make a roster, Isaiah Hodgins will not make the Bills' 53-man roster. He finishes the preseason with 16 receptions on 21 targets for 124 yards Certainly came up with a few big plays, had a number of great plays along the sideline, just came down with a few crazy catches. And again, he's a guy that they've had around for a couple of years. They obviously like him. They've been developing him quite a bit. And again, just unique size, unique frame for the position. And he's still relatively young. Certainly a guy that you would like to stick around and have develop in your system for longer, especially given the circumstances that your former assistant GM and your former offensive coordinator are now running a team down there in New York and they need a wide receiver. So if Isaiah Hodgins does not make this team, he's going to New York, right? If he doesn't go somewhere else, he's going to be on an NFL team next year, probably the New York Giants, likely not the Buffalo Bills. So with Isaiah Hodgins, to me, it does just come down to a numbers game. It does just come down to you're gonna keep six i think you're keeping six and the top five are locks stefan diggs gabriel davis isaiah mckenzie jamison crowder khalil shakir and so it comes down to kumro versus um, hodgins and out of your sixth wide receiver i guess you would like big play ability but that's not my focus out of my sixth receiver like it's cool if he has it but if that's his strength Right. If it, if that's his strength, it's like the occasional splash play from my sixth receiver. I would rather have the guy who's going to consistently contribute on special teams uh, because he's that's the bigger role that my sixth receiver is going to have on game days each and every Sunday or whenever the Bills play, as opposed to, you know, he, he's not getting on the field. The sixth receiver is not getting on the field in the regular season, barring any extreme circumstances, you know, unfortunate injuries, things like that. So just assuming everything's even, equal playing field, I'd rather go with the guy who offers me more on special teams. And Kumro uh, has been a special teams stalwart, special teams ace here for the Bills for a couple of years. Uh, And, you know, given that they're transitioning to a similar but, you know, new coach, it's just the assistant promoted. But again, I would want a guy who's been in the system, who's been with this team for a while on special teams. I would want that to help continue that transition along that's what Jay Kumro offers and then you look at what Isaiah Hodgins has done on special teams 
didn't really look all that great in the preseason. They tried. They gave him the opportunity, had 26 snaps on special teams in the preseason. Again, missed a few blocks, had a 42.4 grade from PFF. Say what you will about PFF grades, but, you know, that's just, just what happened. Uh, I, I am not denying that long-term Isaiah Hodgins will be a better NFL wide receiver than Jay Kumro. I am not saying that he will not be in the slightest. Isaiah Hodgins, again, will be a better receiver than Jay Kumro. But I just think given the Bills' current situation, what they need this year as a win-now team, I would love to keep Isaiah Hodgins around and develop him on the practice squad. But that's just, I don't think that's something that the Bills are going to be able to do. And just, again, given their situation, I think you need to go with the special team's ability more than the big play from the sixth receiver ability. So that's why I give the nod to Kumro over Hodgins. Maybe not a popular opinion, but that's just how I think it's going to shake out. I agree. I mean, they've said for a long time, like they value versatility in their players. And if you're not going to be out there, then you need to be able to do special teams. And, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, Isaiah Hodges is not good on special teams. He's been playing special teams in the preseason, but he hasn't been very good. Uh, Isaiah Hodges is a good receiver. Unfortunately, this is a team with a lot of good receivers, like a lot of good receivers. They like Jeet Kumaro. They know what he brings on special teams. They're probably going to go with him. And Isaiah Hodges is probably going to be – pretty solid with the New York Giants this season. So, you know, good for him for, yeah. You know, regardless, I mean, seriously, good for him for, for coming in and, and working all the entire time he's been in Buffalo to where he's in the, in a position as a former six round pick to be able to say, Hey, you know, this is somebody we'd like to keep around, but realistically he's going to get claimed by somebody because he, he has worked hard and he has been really good. It's just, you know, it, it truly is just a numbers game. And and we got to keep somebody who can do more than just the things we're already really good at, which is having guys who can catch the ball. We got we got some we got some good discourse going on in chat that I do want to bring up here. Um, Ned had a good comment or uh, someone was saying right here. Yeah, Ned Hodgins can play the slot. He's more valuable long term than Jamison Crowder. Keep both Kumro and Hodgins, cut Crowder or trade him. Why do you have to make it between, or why do we make it between Kumro and Hodgins? Interesting thought, but I I very much like the insurance policy of Jamison Crowder, right? Look, we like Isaiah McKenzie. We know what Isaiah McKenzie mm-hmm. is, though. Uh, I, or maybe we don't know what he is. I think he could break out a little bit this year. Yeah. At least he's being put in a position to do so. But... I, I would rather have the known commodity insurance policy in Jamison Crowder behind Isaiah McKenzie more than I would rather the big slot Isaiah Hodgins where long, I mean, he can, right. He can do big slot stuff, but sure. I long term, I don't think that's Isaiah Hodgins role in the NFL. I don't think he's a slot receiver. Yeah. Uh, what drugs are you smoking? McDermott should be fired if he cuts Hodgins. I'm clearly drinking wine, John. So that's a good check point. yourself. Yeah, I, I'm unfortunately not on any drugs right now at the moment. Maybe uh, in a couple of minutes, right? Maybe in like an hour, uh, I'll let you know. Yeah. But um, no, and also I think that's uh, – I don't think McDermott would be fired for cutting a, a six-string that, wide receiver. Yeah, I mean um, – But <laughs> again, <laughs> but that's, what, that's another thing we have to consider, right, is this is I, – I like Hodgins. I would like to develop him further given the opportunity. I just don't – you can get another Isaiah Hodgins, I think. Yeah. Like this was in the same dra- he was in the same draft <laughs> class as Gabe Davis, right? So like you you can just you can get these these day three receivers who and we've given Isaiah Hodgins two years here to develop and he's flashing now. Granted, he really hasn't had the opportunity to flash before, but mm-hmm. he's just flashing now. I think you know the Bills draft another receiver next year. And you'll you'll have a new guy to get hyped about. I, that's that's really. I'm not losing sleep. I would again. I would like to keep Isaiah Hodgins, but I'm not going to be losing sleep if we if the Bills are not able to hold on to him. I agree. Okay, what's your first roster thought slash prediction? So my first roster spot 
is that David Questenberry and Spencer Brown will be platooning the right tackle spot. So obviously Spencer Brown had a procedure in the off season and he's been working his way back slowly from that procedure, which is fine. This is how they tend to address the injuries with this team. It's part of the reason why they have been a very healthy team during the McBean era. Um, not a, they, they tend to, to, to be slow with guys when it comes to injuries and they tend to not have a lot of lingering issues. So it's, it's, it's nice. Um, however, um, when you're going against the Super Bowl champions, you'd like to have your uh, second round right tackle or your second year third round right tackle out there, uh, especially uh, you, just, just, you, you, you wanted to get reps. You wanted to get reps against a good team. You wanted to, to feel comfortable, but you also don't want to put your team in a position where he's he's having to adjust to everything because he's only really been able to get maybe a month's amount of work in. Um, so this is why you signed David Questenberry and David Questenberry has been a solid uh, fill in at, at right tackle in his career. Um, so I, I would be surprised if they went with Questenberry the entire game. I'll be interested to see um, after the game on Thursday, not this Thursday, next Thursday, um, what the actual splits of the reps are between the two. Um, but it's, it's, I, I just can't see a scenario where they both are, or, or hold on, reverse that, rewind, um, where, where one is taking all the reps and the other isn't taking anything. I, I just, I can't see that happening. So I think that they will be splitting reps. How they split the reps is going to be up to the coaching staff, obviously, but, I just uh, I I can't see a scenario where it's just one guy in this. So I I agree to start, uh, especially like like we've been talking about, uh, given the the off season procedure that that Spencer Brown underwent. Um, I thought like at this point in the off season, uh, if it were just they were easing Spencer Brown back into the lineup, he would have been back in the lineup by now. Uh, so mm-hmm. I do think you're right. I think you're on to something. I think there is going to be a bit more of a platoon between Questenberry and Brown than at least we initially thought. Um, and and Questenberry, pretty good, right? Like not a bad player. Certainly a, a serviceable, usable right tackle. And Spencer Brown, and as John writes here, what, keep an eye out for Spencer Brown under Aaron Cromer. That's something I'm really mm-hmm. interested to see, like I alluded yeah. to earlier. Just given, again, he was this raw a- a- athlete, really, out of UNI, uh, who flashed last year at times, also didn't look that great at times. Um, but again, now under better consistent or more consistent coaching uh, and or a scheme that seems to help most of the people uh, under a coach who seems to help most of the people who enter it and, or, you know, get under his tutelage, Spencer Brown under Aaron Cromer, assuming they click, well, let's hope, you know, I, I think that really could pan out. But again, to start at least, I do think we're going to see a bit of a platoon, but ultimately it's Spencer Brown's job, yeah. uh, you know, to, to take back. There's, there's you- we're, we're still talking about Hodgins in the chat, Dave. <laughs> There's still Hodgin stock. I knew how, the people. How? What do? Why do people get so attached to these people? Why do people get so attached to the like fifth or sixth player at a position? We did it's this a, with Duke Williams. Yeah, people are probably very... still doing this with Duke Williams. I guarantee, at some point in the season, somebody's going to like at the official Buffalo Bills account and be like. Oh well, Duke Williams would have made that catch. Like, it'll be me. I'll do it. <laughs> you're no, you're going to do it with Lavisca, which is actually going to be worse. But <laughs> the, I did. It's just I, I don't. I don't. Like guys, the team has Stefan Diggs. I know it's been a while since you've seen him. I know it's been a while, but like, Stefan Diggs needs to be your focus here. Gabe Davis needs to be good here. Or your focus here. Isaiah McKenzie needs to be your focus here. Why are we so obsessed with with a former sixth-round pick? 
Christian Wait, yes, thank you, Charles. Christian Wait, another great example. Like Christian Wait's a great Isaiah story. Hodgins has played football before. <laughs> I, also true, but like Christian Wait, I mean Christian Wait's a great story, but like, why are we so obsessed with these guys like trying to make the team? Like, come on, what are we doing? Why are we awake? Why are we doing this? Uh, boy. Anyway, that's my that's my rant for the night. Um, so yeah, I'll let the chat berate me for the next 20 minutes while we move on into your uh your next take what's your next take kyle so i teased it earlier i could see uh or i would be happy with this team carrying eight cornerbacks and i again just numbers wise it's kind of a crazy thought right eight cornerbacks 12 dbs that's it's a wild thought but when you when i read the names to you that i'm considering here and when you consider each of their roles and when you consider that you know a handful of them are nickel players and then another handful are special teamers it's not as crazy as maybe you know that just the idea of eight corners would would lead you to believe so the names that i have the eight that i have here written down are tredavious white dane jackson kair elam Christian Benford, Taryn Johnson, Saran Neal, Cam Lewis, and Nick McLeod. Uh, I think it's fair to say that six of these players are roster locks, right? Trey White, Dane Jackson, Kyer Elam, Christian Benford played his way into lock territory in the preseason. And then Taryn Johnson, one of the better nickel cornerbacks in the league. And then Saran Neal, one of the better special teams players in the league, just got extended a, a couple years ago, I do believe. So, um, I think those six are certainly locks. So I think six is a realistic number. I think seven is the most realistic number in terms of cornerback. And I think eight is a long shot, but also not out of the realm of possibilities. It's going to come down to Cam Lewis versus Nick McLeod. And it's a take your pick type of thing, right? Because Cam Lewis has been with the team longer uh, maybe a more processy story, if you will, the idea of undrafted out of Buffalo and just kind of sticks with the team out of or, you know, yeah. they develop him on the practice squad for a while. And he's just kind of up and down all the time to the point where now he's just this versatile depth defensive back who's pretty good. Uh, and then also Nick McLeod, who they like, who they brought back on the practice squad last year after uh, the Cincinnati Bengals stole him at some point. Um, so they really like both of these guys, obviously, and they were kind of this was like an underrated competition throughout camp or not camps, but more so just the preseason, because you look at how they divvied up this uh, the snaps here. Right. They put these guys all over the field to just see what they can do in a variety of positions to see who should make the roster. Uh, Cam Lewis had 44 uh, snaps in the slot. Throughout the preseason, he had 27 at safety and 14 on special teams. Then you look at Nick McLeod. He had 12 snaps in the slot, 53 out wide, 22 at safety. That was just in week one. And then he had 29 special team snaps. Uh, Both are young. I think like Lewis has been in the league for a couple of more years than McLeod, but I think they're only actually like a year apart in age. So age isn't that big of a gap there. Um, But yeah. I like both of them. They both can play teams. They both have long-term upside, I think. Uh, And again, you look at what they did with McLeod, just kind of this playing him everywhere, see what he can do. Again, 12 in the slot, 53 out wide, 22 at safety. They were just kind of throwing him all over the place, seeing where he could stick. Again, and more on special teams. I think you would have a not an easy time, getting him to the practice squad. But I think out of the eight names, and obviously only two of them are realistic cut candidates, but out of the, again, the two names, we'll say that he has the better shot of getting to the practice squad. But again, we know that's not a given because the Cincinnati Bengals stole him last year. Uh, And then you have Cam Lewis, who I I think likely will make the roster, to be honest. You see that uh, he's the backup nickel, really, because Saran Neal, primarily a special teamer i think you can kind of write him off as a defensive player at this point they tried that last preseason didn't do much uh didn't really shine so i think cam lewis is really the primary backup nickel which 
a lot of teams don't carry a backup nickel, but given how right. often the Bills play nickel, you kind of need that insurance policy mm-hmm. should something happen to Taron Johnson. And he's had some injury concerns in the past, so you do kind of sure. want that insurance. And again, you can also put Cam Lewis at safety, as we've seen. He can do it. He uh, can play teams. So again, if I had to guess, you're going to get the six. Uh, you're with Trey White, and then you're going to get Cam Lewis. You'll try to get Nick McLeod back on the practice squad. It becomes more interesting if Trey White goes on the pup list, on the physically unable to perform list, then maybe you're able to, to grab a Nick McLeod into the season with you. But I, I will just have to wait and see how they feel about the, um, you know, about Trey White's timeline. Uh, it's funny because I'm kind of making the same argument that I made, or it's the same argument with Hodgins as it is for McLeod, where it's like this year, the upside isn't that great, but long-term they could be contributors. Um, but I, I, and I'm going to make a similar argument with Quentin Morris here in in our next segment, but, uh, I, I I like Nick McLeod. I would like to keep him around because I don't think you're getting him back. Really. You're probably not getting him back if you cut him. So Eight corners, not going to happen, but realistically, or it, it's not unfathomable, which in and of itself is kind of unfathomable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just, I think it's going to come down to just Nick McLeod versus Kim Lewis. Yeah. Whether that's fair or not. And and it's it's tough. Again, this is it's sort of like the receiver conversation, sort of, where it's like, you know, uh, these guys are, not bad. They're they're certainly deserving of a spot near the bottom of the roster, but it's still just a numbers game, and you just gotta you gotta figure out who who you're able to keep on a practice squad, who's able to clear waivers, that sort of thing. It's tough, um, but uh, to me, either either one, I'm good with either one. I'm I'm not gonna sit here and say like I definitely want Cam Lewis over Nick McLeod or vice versa. It's just like I. They're, they both bring what you want on defense. They both bring a good attitude. They both bring like that same, like you said, process mentality. Um, so I'm not sure, but whatever decision they make, they kind of can't go wrong. So um, uh, it, it, it'll be it'll be worth seeing what what actually shakes up with that. So. I would say I think Lewis is more likely to make the roster. But that being said, I think they're more likely to get an asset for Cam Mm. Lewis. So straight up, I think I would rather Cam, again, all things equal. I need to pick one to make the bottom of my roster. I would rather Cam Lewis than I would Nick McLeod. But I would also rather Nick McLeod and a sixth round pick than I would Cam Lewis, if that makes sense. Like, Give me the yeah. pick for Lewis, and I'm fine with McLeod. I'm more than happy with McLeod if you're going to give me a draft pick in exchange for Cam Lewis. Yeah, I would agree with that. Cam Lewis, you be bull. You be alumni. Why? There you go. Do you know that uh, the Bulls the might be the best team in the country this year, actually? People are talking. I've heard Good playoff hype. I've heard some playoff hype for uh, the Bulls. Good for them. Good for them. Um, good for the you, fans that – Believe that. All bully zero off that. We believe, <laughs> David. God. That that Not takes me back believe. to uh <laughs> that takes me back to uh oh crap, who's that who's that awful GM that was the president? Brandon something. Who was the awful GM that was the president? Of the Bills. Oh, Russ Brandon. Russ Brandon, there we go. God. Jason writes, who would give up a draft pick for Lewis? The New York football giants. They're the That's ones right. who would give up. Uh, I don't and, know. Why don't we find out? <laughs> right. Like, it wouldn't, wouldn't shock me. Again, yeah, Joe Shane. Joe Shane had a hand probably in signing Cam Lewis and has been around for the entirety of Cam Lewis's development, I think. Uh, and again, as we said, I think Lewis is making the roster unless he is traded for, uh, unless you can get an asset in return. I don't think you're just letting Cam Lewis walk for nothing. Could be wrong, though. Probably will be. David, what's your second roster thought? Uh, my second roster thought is probably not overly controversial or weird, at least I don't think. Um, Dane Jackson will be listed as cornerback one ahead of Kyrie Elam with Trey White still being unavailable. 
Um, you know, uh, it's been the tendency of this particular staff to bring along rookies slowly. They don't really have a choice with Kyrie Elam in this particular case, just because of Trey White's injury. Um, however, I think that's okay, just because you know. He is so gifted and really smart, and and you see that you see that explosiveness and that technique, just just in the preseason we saw that. I mean, it's it's really impressive. He's somebody that's been impressive during the preseason, and yeah, he's been a little crappy at times, and I'm sure we'll see that um, in the first couple of games, especially against the Rams. But regardless of all that, I mean, Dane Jackson had to come in last year and be that number two guy, um, and he performed quite well. And now that Levi Wallace is out, you got to, you know, step up and be the guy. And and I think that he's going to continue to be solid with this team. I think he's, uh, him and Kyrie Elam are a solid pairing. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I don't, I don't expect them, especially in week one, to try and uh, match up Kyrie Elam against Allen Robinson, right? Because, like, Cooper Cup's in the slot, so he's going to go against Taron Johnson, right? That's how, right, that's, theoretically, yeah. yeah. That's that's the theory, anyway. So I, I would rather try and see Dane Jackson against Allen Robinson, and just sort of see what happens there, and then maybe, yeah, maybe they maybe they switch things around, and maybe they just want to be more physical with uh, with Allen Robinson, and then you can bring Kyrie Elam in because you know he's just going to try and bully whoever's in front of him. Um, but yeah, I just I you know, this is this this is sort of very expected. I'm not I'm not gonna call this as, as Jason Taylor says. Uh, I would call that a a cold take, David. Uh, that, that's very accurate, very accurate. I'm okay with that though. Well, it's at one point this preseason it was maybe kind of looking hot because uh, mm. the, the Christian Benford hive was very strong. That is true. That is true. Uh, that kind of died down a little bit though. Christian Benford. Uh, Villanova, right? <laughs> That's all I have to say about That's Christian right. Bedford. Yeah, no, he uh, he looked he looked uh, real promising in the preseason. Yeah. He'll make the roster, but again, I unless disaster strikes, unless Elam just is not playable or Dane Jackson, yeah. uh, I think I think you're right. I think you're going with Jackson and Elam until White is fully ready to go, and I think you are going to get solid enough and consistent enough play out of Elam and out of Jackson that you're going to survive until Travis White is fully ready to go. And even if you don't, I do like, as I said, eight guys. I think I do yeah. like the depth enough that I'm, you know, they'll be able to figure it out. Should Jackson and Elam, which figure to be the initial pairing, should that not work? I think they can, they do have enough depth to figure it out on the fly, whether it be with a Benford uh, or a McLeod or someone like that, maybe a Saran Neal who, uh, nope, actually, no, I lied about Saran Neal, but what are you going to do? Um, no, I, I do think that there's enough depth that it's going, it's probably going to work the first time. I like that pairing enough. I think that is the best pairing out of the non Tredavious white cornerbacks. But even if it's not, I think that they have the bodies to figure it out. My next, um, you know, uh, again, this is a bold one. This yeah. is a bold one because it kind of goes against logic in a lot of ways, which is it. a lot of my personality. Uh, a lot yeah. of my personality is I lay yeah. out a logical argument and then I just say, I like the opposite thing. Regardless <laughs> of what, the, regardless of reality, I want to live in my fantasy world. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about here in regards to the tight end situation. Now, Eric put out a killer, like seven or eight minute video about the tight end situation uh, earlier. I, I think it was earlier today. It's, it's short, it's digestible, really informative. And I implore you all to go watch it. After you watch this video, after we conclude, and before you watch the air raid hour, of course, at 9 p.m., uh, assuming we we leave you with enough time to do okay. so. <laughs> um, so, tight end. Dawson Knox is the starting tight end. Okay, that's not a hot take. I think despite uh, what could be perceived as a lackluster offseason from O.J. Howard, I think that O.J. Howard has a role on this team. Uh, and that's he's not what we thought he was coming out of Alabama. He's never been what we thought he was coming out of Alabama. Yeah. What he is is a fine blocking tight end number two option. Uh, and given that he has a $3.245 million dead cap hit 
and the Bills just restructured deals and kind of worked around things to uh, free up roughly that much in salary cap space because they like breathing room. So what do they have, like $6 million in breathing room? Uh, right now, I don't th- – like I think the actual number listed is 10, but it's actually more like 6 or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't see them cutting their breathing room in half by cutting O.J. Howard. That just doesn't seem like something uh, – a guy who still does have some level of value. I don't think that O.J. Howard is getting cut. So that leaves us with tight end three. The competition, or, or at least the two names, are Quentin Morris and Tommy Sweeney. And again – I'm going to break down the situation logically. Logic would point to Tommy Sweeney being the better fit for tight end three. He's been here longer. He's the third tight end on the depth chart. I don't think they're going to run a lot of of three tight end sets. Uh, But if they do, I, I think that like the third tight end would primarily be a blocker, uh, which is one of the stronger suits of Tommy Sweeney's game, at least compared to Quentin Morris. Tommy Sweeney is a much better blocker than Quentin Morris is. Uh, So just given that, right, given that I don't think the role is going to be all that big, and given what the role is going to be, should it exist, it's going to be this particular type of player, and Sweeney fits that mold better, and thus Sweeney would be the more appropriate fit. That all makes sense. I just think Quentin Morris... (laughs) is a better player i just think you know hands down quentin morris is a better football player than tommy sweeney and and i kind of went against this is kind of against my my hodgins kumro argument right Mm -hmm. right it's the that's the logic reverse where with hodgins it's like yeah long term he's the better option but kumro's better for the role that he's going to have in this case it's like sweeney's better for the role but Morris has more long-term op or more long-term upside, but it's different. It's different because it's not like Sweeney is an infinitely better special teams player than Quentin Morris is. Whereas that is the case with Kumro and Hodgins. In in the case of of Sweeney and Morris, it's like maybe a marginal difference, or at least the the, the gap is much smaller than it is between Hodgins and Kumro. And you look at Morris. More again, Eric brought this up in his video earlier. Is such a or, <laughs> I started reaching Calgary Mafia. It's such a sassy <laughs> take. I agree. It's a, it's a very sassy take. I agree. But um, but with Quentin Morris, the the more or as Eric said in the video, more of a modern tight end, right? He's a a much more modern tight end than Tommy Sweeney is a much better receiver had four receptions for 55 yards in the preseason just showed speed uh was it against the Colts where he just had that play where he just burned a defender and then yeah it just that's a tight end doing that that's uh, granted former wide receiver converted tight end but that's a tight end doing that so I just think at some point you just have to look at Tommy Sweeney and say he's this is his fourth year here We know what Tommy Sweeney is. He's a cool third tight end. He has a role. But if I'm for, like, I know he's not going to be more than this. He's never going to be more than what he is right now. Whereas I look at Quentin Morris, and it's like, I I think he could be something more than this. And especially given the contract situations of the Bills, number one and number two on the depth chart are in the final years of their deals. With Howard, it was a one-year deal. Knox is in the final year of his rookie deal. I'm not saying Quentin Morris is a, you know, a lock to become tight end one or two next year. But what I am saying is that he has more long-term upside than Tommy Sweeney. So I would like to keep him on the roster, give him opportunities to get live game reps this year. And maybe he does impress. Maybe he does show that he is someone who can be developed along further into a starting tight end, into a tight end one or a tight end two. Certainly more upside than Tommy Sweeney in that regards. Um, The issue, again, Eric brought this up in the video. The biggest issue with Quentin Morris is that, like, Reggie Gilliam does a lot of the same things that they would be asking Quentin Morris to do. That That's kind of, you might be doubling up on the same player with Reggie Gilliam and Quentin Morris. But again, I'm talking, the the majority of my reasoning for keeping Quentin Morris is the long term, right? It's a a stash, really, uh, to use a fantasy football term. You're stashing Quentin Morris on the roster, thinking that long term, he could be a contributor for you. 
Uh, so Gilliam would do that stuff this year. Uh, but I'm never looking at Gilliam as like a guy who could realistically start for me at tight end at any point. Whereas with Quentin Morris, maybe one day he's how old is Quentin Morris? If he's 23, I am. I he's am, 23. If so, that is uh, that just is very. Yeah, he's 23. There you have it. Yes, he's still very young, uh, younger than me. And that's how I judge if people are young or not. Um, but, uh, <laughs> he is he's younger than me. And I think he could one day be a player for this team. And I think in order for that to happen, he has to make the roster this year. So that is my Morris is the new Jason Kroom. Where's the lie? Oh, oh, well, you know, there, there's, <laughs> there are some very, some very obvious uh, differences between, <laughs> between Quentin Morris and Jason Kroom. Um, maybe, maybe all I'm saying is Jason Kroom, like, really never should have been on the roster. Maybe that's, maybe that's my hot take on, on Jason Kroom. Uh, whereas Quentin Morris, I think Quentin Morris has already shown enough that uh, I've seen enough from Quentin Morris to think that he could could long term be a player. I've said that eight times. Jason writes, "Oh my God, he's younger than Tremaine. He is, and he's in. We don't even know what year he's in. He's twenty three in year two. Craziness, craziness. It is crazy. All right, we're we're gonna move on. I have nothing to say to this. Is Sweeney <laughs> ever going to get picked up by a, another team? I think either realistically. Because the Giants have a, a big hole at tight end. The Giants have like no depth at tight end, really no players at tight end, to be fair. But uh, I think Tommy Sweeney would be a lock for the Giants, given that he's been with Dable for years. Joe Shane was here when they drafted him. But again, you can make the same point. That's what's so difficult about this roster trim this year is that two guys that have been here forever, more than two guys actually, but guys who have been here forever now have a bad team that can roster our castaways, so or the Bills castaways rather. So it's just, I think Sweeney may be more of a lock than Quentin Morris to go to the Giants should Sweeney. Sweeney's a New York Giant, let's just be honest. He and Isaiah Hodgins, should be booking the same flight right now, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they've already discussed potentially getting an apartment together. This is this is my Tommy Sweeney and Isaiah Hodgins fanfic. I'm writing a sitcom about the two right now. All right, I now we really need to move on. <laughs> oh boy, we gotta we gotta. What's your All third right. roster prediction? My, my third roster prediction, which certainly won't cause any sort of controversy or issues, is that Bobby Hart is going to make this roster. I I kind of already uh... Uh, I, I teased this I teased this last week with uh, with 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 Hanson um, that Bobby Hart was going to make the roster um, and that Bills Mafia was going to be okay, kind of okay with it. Um, he called that rubbish. Um, but, uh, I just, I think he's a perfectly decent, um, depth guard at this point of his career. And I think that his improvements with Aaron Cromer have been clear and significant. I think that, uh, you know, I, you want somebody who is at least familiar with the team and the system and the scheme. And I think that Bobby Hart, you know, for all of the times he's been in Buffalo <laughs> on and off this roster, he, he's got enough familiarity and now he's actually improved somewhat. I'd rather him be a, an okay backup guard than a turnstile backup left tackle. So yeah, I think Bobby Hart makes this team. Not as bold and not as silly, maybe as one would have thought it to be at the start of the season. Because again, oh, as I, agree. You said, I never you, thought I would be saying this now. Right. And, and be- like you're still gonna get the groans tomorrow when it yeah. happens because it's it's probably going to happen. He's a he's a fine guard. Uh again, the the first the first uh to the first what disciple of Aaron Cromer, if you will, at least in Buffalo. Um, he's already made Bobby Hart look like a serviceable guard. Again, not right. great by any means, but like there are very few good backup guards in the NFL. They just right. don't exist. Um, so uh, if they're they're good, they'd be starting elsewhere. So 
just I think we I think you're right. I think we have seen enough from Bobby Hart that he's uh he's going to be on this team as a fine to serviceable backup guard. Uh but again, if they if they do cut him, I'm not losing sleep. I'm not gonna be overly concerned yeah. about it. It is what it is. I think that wraps up the roster talk. If anyone has any uh, further questions about the roster, please let us know. We will try to get to them. But until then, we're going to go to everyone's favorite segment, David. It is true Let's or rubbish. Rubbish. Let's go. Let's see if this is true or rubbish. This is the segment where I provide David with a number of statements. Uh, and I, I say them in a declarative <clears throat> manner, in such a way that you would think that I am sta- stating my opinion, but I'm not. I'm simply giving David a prompt, and then he will tell me whether or not that prompt is true or rubbish. I have three for you today, David. Are you ready to go? I am always ready. This is a bold one. especially <laughs> This is going to piss the people off, and that's partially why it. I did it. So- the Bills should be looking for wide receiver depth after tomorrow's cuts. We're going to call that rubbish. That is rubbish all after all. It was all, all after all? Rubbish. Why? Why do you say that? They've got plenty of wide receiver depth. What are we talking about? Well, now when they cut Hodgins, they're going to they're gonna need a... It sucks to suck. Sorry, but like... <laughs> they're going to need a guy after they cut Isaiah Hodgins. Jameson Crowder, Jameson Crowder and Khalil Shakir. But, I mean, what more do you need? What more do you need? I know nobody's really high on Jameson Crowder at the moment because he didn't do anything in the preseason and he got hurt in training camp, which is exactly what we were all afraid of when he came to this team. But I, assuming he's healthy enough to play in the regular season, he's going to be a good contributor. And Khalil Shakir, I mean, we've seen what he's done in the preseason as a result of him of, of Crowder not being available. He's been awesome. I mean, I, I'm 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 way more excited about the future of Khalil Shakir than I ever thought I would be. I'm I'm super excited, but for him to be the the fifth guy, presumably on this roster, yeah, I'm um, I'm okay with that, and that's perfectly fine and reasonable. So no, they should not be looking for wide receiver depth after tomorrow's cuts. True or rubbish? OJ Howard is still a bill at this time tomorrow. I'm gonna call that true. This was true all after all. Can believe wow. it. It was true. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I understand there's been some uh, disappointments with O.J. Howard. We've kind of talked about that. But they signed him to be the tight end, too. He's going to be the tight end, too. And that's fine. You don't need the tight end, two to be a superstar. You don't need the tight end, two to be scoring multiple touchdowns in the Super Bowl or anything like that. What you need is for him to block. And O.J. Howard can block, for the most part. Um, and, you know, I mean, I just I I don't see the point in cutting OJ Howard uh, unless you get like a legitimate trade for him. Which like before I would have said, hey, maybe trade OJ Howard for a punter. Not the best idea, but it's it's, it's something that could work. Um, but you know, not there's several punters out there available. It's like well, why why do that at this point? You know. And, and honestly, who's who's going to offer something for O.J. Howard that's worth trading him for at this at, the, at this point in the game? It's just – it doesn't make sense at this point. So, yes, O.J. Howard is going to be a Buffalo Bill at this time tomorrow. If you were Brandon Bean, what would the offer have to be for you to seriously consider moving O.J. Howard? <sighs> a player and a pick. A player and a pick. Wow. Yeah. Like nothing major, like you know, if somebody has a halfway decent like backup offensive lineman or developmental offensive lineman and like a conditional seventh that could be turned to a sixth, I'd be okay with that. What if they do like a Ryan Bates thing where it's like a couple of years ago they traded Eli Harold for yeah. Ryan Bates and nobody gave no one well, gave a shit. Here's no the one thing. cared. No one cared because Eli Harold was awful and we all knew mm-hmm. that. I mean at least I knew that. Um, I knew that when he came out of the draft in 2015, <laughs> but he, the Niners still took him in the third round for some stupid ass reason. Um, 
<laughs> this got very, this turned very quickly into right, a, a, a Eli hostile Harold. Eli Harold. Eli Harold, Harold catching a lot of crossfire very quickly. Sorry. <laughs> but, Poor guy. No, OJ Howard, OJ Howard is who he is, you know, and that's fine. There's, we don't need to, it's, it's, he's not bad. He's not spectacular, but he doesn't have to be. You have Dustin Knox. Let's roll with that. That might be the best bean trade, actually, now that we think about it. Yeah, He's had a lot I of mean, good trades. I mean, Doug Whaley had Calvin Shepard for Jerry Hughes. Calvin Shepard now uh, starring in Hard yep. Knocks, ripping into Killing his it. linebacker group for for trying to start my boy Malcolm Rodriguez. <laughs> Killing it. Love it. Uh, Mr. Diggs writes third rounder for Howard. Jason Taylor writes, I would jump at a fifth rounder. I'll compromise. I'd say a fourth. I would say fifth. I'd be like, ah, no. Uh, I, I wouldn't do a fifth. Fourth for if OJ Howard. If somebody is offering a third round pick for OJ Howard, who like any team could have had for what, $5 million in the offseason? Like, of course I'm taking that trade, but that GM also needs to be like, yeah, brought out to the shed and shot. Like, yeah, you've I lost yeah. the plot at that point. Right again, it, dude. The value, and we we both know this. The value of a good college career. Tavon oh, Austin still yeah. still work it off of it. Um, again, and OJ Howard, very different player today. Than Josh Rosen Alabama. is still getting jobs. He is like, and he didn't even have that good of a college career. <laughs> no, this is maybe our most controversial. True or rubbish prompt yet, David? Are you ready? Go for it. True or rubbish? Aaron Cromer could turn me, Kyle, into a replacement level NFL offensive lineman. Kyle, I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that rubbish. That is rubbish all after all. I it disagree. All rubbish. I disagree. I, we, we we do love Aaron Cromer here on this podcast. We do. Um, also, Kyle, um, look, God bless you. Bless your heart. I could do it. You're nowhere even remotely close to the physique needed to be a replacement level um, offensive lineman. Yeah, uh, Jason Taylor asked a great question. Replacing who? Kyle, who are we replacing with? Well, I would be Kyle's on a bad guy. team. I would be on like the Jags or something. <laughs> I, I would be a bad player. I, I again, I'd be replacement level. Backup we, we offensive understand linemen that. are bad. We, we understand all that. I'm not being Quentin Nelson. I'm being like barely in the league. Could Aaron Cromer do this, or is he not that good of a coach? There is so much room in between. Aaron Cromer is a bad coach, and and Aaron Cromer can coach up Kyle Salagi to be a backup offensive lineman. I look, I've, I've been on OL TikTok recently. Those boys shuffle, and I think I could do that. I think I, I think I could really do that. Oh yeah, sorry, we've tried to is, put it the is same. Is Kyle one. anywhere near six four three oh five? I uh, am about three inches off of that, and mm. like. I don't know, uh, roughly half of that. <laughs> uh, but I, I could pack it on, man. I live in Buffalo, New York. I could make it work. Mm. Well, if you ever want to make it work, you, you, you know what to do. You know, get, you get, you can give it a shot. You can give it a shot. But um, you know, Godspeed and good luck to you. I want the record to show <clears throat> that uh, we lost ten viewers when I asked if Aaron Crover could make me. A replays with people, people are just afraid of the truth. Uh, yeah, they're all reporting you for bullying now, David, is what's happening. Everyone's okay, like <laughs> everyone's like a toxic work environment there on the cover one roundup. Okay, it's also time for our second new segment. And I also uh, am going to tease a new segment coming up here. Our newest do... of the new segments. Right. We're going to have another one next week. Now would not have been a good time to introduce mm. the segment named Oopsie of the Week, uh, given the <laughs> given the circumstances. Not the best time for Oopsie of the Week. But next week, Oopsie of the Week makes its debut, uh, where we talk about the Oopsie of the Week. But this week, 
college football starts, David. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. Well, you do know that because I, I made a graphic for it and everything. But uh, <laughs> college football starts. Now, granted, this isn't something that Bills fans really have to worry about now as much as they did a couple of years ago uh, regarding draft prospects and everything. But we're football fans. What the hell else are you watching on Saturday? That's exactly right. Absolutely nothing. So David's new segment here, uh, I call it the David stamp of approval. And I've also made a graphic. Uh, I, I say, I call David's segment this. No, <laughs> we call David's segment the David's uh, stamp of approval. And what he does is each and every week, he will tell you, the great viewers of the Cover One Roundup, one college football game you should be interested slash tuning into this weekend for a variety of reasons, whether it be there's a prospect that could be a fit for the Bills. Maybe, you know, there's a Bills coaching or a Bills player connection regarding the game. Maybe it's just going to be a good football game. I don't know. Uh, but, David, what's your uh, what's your first game here, week one of college football, <clears throat> that you're giving the David stamp of approval to? So here's the thing. Um. Week one of college football. Generally, it's fun, exciting, but most teams are going to be playing a lot of um, directional schools or um, lower level schools. You know, where like, uh, so for example, Michigan State's going to be playing Western Michigan to open their season. Next week, Western Michigan's probably going to be playing a team like Albany. You know, like the, 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 the top feed on the bottom, the bottom feed on the lower bottom. Um, so it, it is what it is. However, there are the occasional, um, fun, uh, cross conference matchups. So this first game is going to be, I, I think really it has the potential to be very interesting. And that is Ohio state versus Notre Dame. You have number two versus number five. Um, you know, sometimes the most obvious choice is the right choice. And it's this game. You have two talented squads. You have a, a title contender, seemingly a perennial title contender in Ohio State. You have a new coach in Marcus Freeman for a blue blood program at Notre Dame. Um, I mean, Brian Kelly's been there for, what, more than 10 years? And mm-hmm. now off to LSU, and now you have Marcus Freeman taking over, seemingly to the uh, to the, uh, the the requests of the coaches and the players who wanted Marcus Freeman there. There's always – Tons of legitimate NFL talent on both of these teams. And, you know, as far as week one games go, this is probably about as much fun as you can reasonably predict. You know, there might be some some uh, crazy upset, um, maybe some random school just gets the better of one of these other schools. But um, as far as what we can reasonably predict, this is going to be a, uh, a pretty good game, in my personal opinion. Also, uh, shout out to uh, Florida versus Utah, which could also be an interesting one as well. Billy Napier taking over for Florida. Utah has been a pretty successful program in the last couple of years. And also uh, Cincinnati versus Arkansas. Cincinnati lost a ton of NFL talent this past draft, uh, coming off a playoff berth. Um, and Arkansas, I don't know if anybody watches University of Arkansas football, uh, but their coach, Sam Pittman, Looks like he was literally made by God to coach the University of Arkansas Razorbacks. Hell um, yes. He is a gift to college football. He is a gift to the University of Arkansas. And I will be so disappointed if he if he ever goes anywhere else with this coaching career. He needs to be like a 40-year type of guy. He needs to just stay at that program for the rest of his life. Drop dead on the field if need be. I'm not convinced Arkansas is a real place. I'm going to be honest with you. Fair. Fair, uh, totally reasonable, but apparently it is, and apparently they play football there. They have a college. Darren McFadden went there. Uh, it was pretty – again, Ellis just – there. Why would – why on earth would they be running a fun-ass offense with Darren McFadden in Arkansas? Darren McFadden, Felix Jones, and Peyton Hills were all at Arkansas at the same time. They were. Craziness. But regardless of Arkansas – you're giving the David seal of approval. That's right. The David Fox seal of approval, as I've written, uh, to Marcus Freeman and the <laughs> Ohio State. This is, this is apparently Marcus Freeman when he was playing at the Ohio, the Ohio at the State University. Ohio State. So yeah. it is, yes. There's, there's a fun, there's fun little, uh, fun little storyline that I'm sure will be um, right, the wildly Mata. overcovered during that game. So. Uh. 
<laughs> um, sorry, I'm reading the chat here. Don't the Bills have one of the biggest O, o- line in the uh, in the NFL? Does Kyle look at himself as an OL and not as a third tight end depth? I I could start. You know I what? Might... You know what? We missed uh, that. That that's a very good point. It's David, good true point. or rubbish? Hold up, I'm doing an emergency one. David, <laughs> true or rubbish? I am a better developmental tight end than Quentin Morris. <laughs> That's rubbish, Kyle. That is rubbish. All I disagree. I'm going to disagree rubbish. with that one, man. It, it, uh, it, listen, I'm I'm going with your previous take. You're the one wanting Quentin Morris on the roster. You want me to say that you're better than Quentin Morris right I'm now? I'm a sneaky athlete, though, man. Sneaky athlete, high motor. Uh, Jason Peters, this is Ralph Wilson Sr., emerging from the grave to, Thank to, you for joining to grace us, Ralph. the chat. Uh, Jason Peters was a 300-pound tight end at Arkansas. He was actually at Arkansas State. Which is why no NFL team really took notice of him. <laughs> right. It wasn't that he was a 300 pound tight end. Or that too. But, <laughs> but, yeah. The whole Arkansas State. <laughs> yeah, it was both. Maybe, maybe a combination of the both. Actually, um, I, need to, I need to double check this now, or else I'm going to sound like an ass. <laughs> Bill's uh, legend. No, it was University of Arkansas. I am wrong. I am totally Whoa! wrong. That is my fault. That was rubbish. Thank you, Ralph Wilson Sr. Yeah, Ralph Wilson That was Sr. rubbish. He, a good friend of Jerry Jones, That's Arkansas's right. proudest son. You don't think he wow. knew that Jason That's Peters went there? That's my bad. Wow. Were That's Rob Wilson Sr. and Jerry Jones friends? You would just have to assume, right? Probably. Let me call him. Let me don't ask. all old people know each other? I think, especially old white billionaires, I think it's safe yeah. to assume that they're all, you know, semi-close. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching. <laughs> We we did not at all uh, lose no, juniors in the grave. Okay. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's we right. apologize, Ralph, that you outlived your son. Um, thank you guys for watching. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the Cover One YouTube channel. Again, there's the subscribe button here, uh, right underneath this video. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok at some very Instagram at some variation of at Cover One. Make sure to. Subscribe to the Cover One iTunes feeds. Uh, there's numerous ones. Uh, there's ones for Roundup, Air Raid Hour, uh, Sky's Coverage, Going Deep, Cover One Buffalo, Film Room. All of us, all, all the great podcasts have um, what they're called podcast feeds. And I would very much appreciate if you subscribed and left a five star or an honest review. You know, do whatever your heart desires. Make sure to check out Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code COVER1 for your first deposit up to $100 matched. Uh, yeah, and you're, as I said, as I said in roundabout terms there, your first deposit up to $100 is matched by Underdog. Make sure to check out COVER1 One Pass. Become an insider. Exclusive content. You'll have access to the COVER1 Premium Slack. Great written stuff. Great value as well. $57 a year. I did the math last week. What was it? Like less than five dollars a month or something, something like, that, like yeah. that i'm all about value right burt camper uh, right. it's got his mad hits um uh, that was a, a a bare naked ladies reference i do believe uh, I'm, I'm, thank you i'm full of them here today here on the cover one roundup uh and i think that wraps up all the plugs i do believe thank you for watching david where can the people find you on the twitter the people can find me on twitter at dfoxy at dfauxy um you can find me tweeting inconsistently and with a bunch of uh, lukewarm takes so have fun with that you can follow me on twitter at kyle Salagi. again very much appreciate your viewing we will talk to you next week bye bye